Hey everybody, welcome to part three on this four-part series of uh, uh, microbiology of infectious diseases and we're talking about virulence factors and uh, bacterial virulence. Keep in mind that any pathogen can have virulence factors and probably does have virulence factors, but we're focusing on the bacterial virulence factors right now, um, not viral, not uh, eukaryotic, etc. So let's keep thinking about bacterial virulence and virulence factors and in this episode I want to talk about something called endotoxin, uh, which generally refers to lipid A, and then a variety of exo or secreted protein toxins. So let's start first with endotoxin. Now technically the term endotoxin just means a toxin that's interior to the cell. It's not being secreted by the cell. Uh, most often though, in reality, we simply refer to endotoxin uh, as lipid A, or we refer to lipid A as endotoxin. Lipid A is the most common endotoxin. It's a structural part. This is the, uh, a cross-section of the gram-negative bacteria. It's a structural part of the lipopolysaccharide molecules that make up the majority of this outer leaflet of the outermost membrane. Right? If you remember, gram-negatives have two membranes, an inner membrane and an outer membrane. And the outer membrane, the inner leaflet is made up of your typical uh, phospholipids. The outer membrane has both phospholipids and lipopolysaccharides, where you've got a lipid component, referred to as lipid A, and a long polysaccharide that is uh, relatively specific to that particular species or even that particular strain of gram-negative bacteria. And it turns out that the lipid component that's represented by this little yellow box with the tails here in this drawing, lipid A, is very toxic to mammals and causes a variety of symptoms. I don't think I have anything, I don't have it on my next slide, so I'll just tell you. Um, lipid A causes things like general malaise and aches, uh, can cause fever. Um, too much lipid A can send a person into toxic shock, which um, is when, when there's not enough blood and oxygen getting to the major organs. Tiny amounts of lipid A make us feel sick. Huge amounts of lipid A can actually kill people or other vertebrate organisms. So when you think about it, this means that all gram negatives have lipid A and all gram negatives have this endotoxin, even if they're not pathogenic gram negatives. They've all got at least this one particular uh, virulence factor. So keep that in mind. And it becomes really important as we talk about gram-negative infections, especially bloodstream infections, uh, though not exclusively bloodstream, but it becomes especially important in bloodstream infections, what we call a bacteremia or a sepsis, <clears throat> because the lipid A, even though it's part of the structure of the, the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria, it gets released under two circumstances. It gets released when the bacteria die and the cells explode and that outer membrane starts to degrade, or it gets released during binary fission. So when cells are dividing and making new cells, apparently it's a relatively sloppy process and there's lipid A being sloughed off into the liquid around them. So think about what that would mean. Let's say you've got a patient that comes into the clinic with a bloodstream infection, it's gram negative, and you're gonna wanna start knocking it down right away because you can't let that go for very long without high risk to the patient. But you start killing these bacteria, these gram negatives in the bloodstream, and you're going to start spiking in lipid A in the bloodstream. And so it's very possible that uh, you could actually make things worse in the short term uh, while killing off the bacteria. So it's an important component of the virulence of gram negatives for us to keep in mind. Now, typically, when we're talking about bacterial toxins, we're thinking about exotoxins or secreted toxins. These are protein toxins that are secreted by the pathogen. Now keep in mind we're talking about bacterial toxins. Viruses don't make toxins because they have no, no metabolism and they can't secrete anything, right? So they're not producing and secreting toxins. So these toxins are really a function of bacterial virulence, not a function of viral virulence. So exotoxins are proteins that are secreted, toxic proteins that are secreted by the bacteria. For example, Streptococcus pyogenes, also known as group A strep, which uh, exists in short chains, tends to secrete a, a toxin called hemolysin. Now I'm going to talk about hemolysin or hemolytic toxins in just a second, but I wanted to kind of get you thinking that the idea would be you've got the cells and exterior to the cells you're going to have some concentration of these secreted proteins that do damage to the host. Now let's stop for a second 
and think about why would bacteria secrete toxins? <clears throat> well, one general broad principle might be as a way to weaken the host because the stronger you are as a host, the less good of a petri dish, a food source, you are to the bacteria, right? Remember, they're just trying to make a living. They're just trying to eat you. It's nothing personal. Um, and if you're fighting back, uh, and if you're doing a good job fighting back, they're having a hard time at it. So if they can, you know, one, one, uh, one of the theories is that if they can weaken you, then they're going to have an easier time making a meal out of you. Some toxins perform, like hemolytic toxins, a very specific function that actually helps the bacteria in the process of infecting and feeding on you. So let's talk about that. Hemolytic toxins are also called hemolysins. They're also called cytotoxins uh, or cytolytic toxins. They all mean the same thing. So cytolytic, hemolytic, cytotoxin, um, some people say hemotoxin, but more often they'd say hemolysin. Um, here's the idea. Cyto means cell. Uh, toxin is toxic. Lytic means splitting. Hemo is in reference to red blood cells. So these toxins, while they may or may not actually in a person go after red blood cells, can lyse or rupture red blood cells, which is something that we can detect in the lab, which is where they get this name hemolytic toxins or hemolysins. So on blood auger plates, like you see uh, in both of these pictures, blood auger plates are really just uh, a nutrient auger with all the normal nutrients you'd have in the lab, culturing bacteria, plus fresh red blood cells, usually from sheep. So you've got uh, 5 to 15 percent fresh red blood cells that make them red, the bacteria will grow in colonies and if they can secrete a hemolytic toxin or a cytotoxin of some kind, then they're going to actually create a clearing zone. If they're fully hemolytic, we call that beta hemolytic, where they just completely destroy the red blood cells and degrade the hemoglobin in the process, you get a halo or a clearing zone around the colony uh, where the, the toxin has been secreted and is diffusing out and away. So keep in mind you've got the red blood cells, the toxin hits them, they burst open, and there's some degradation of the, of the, uh, the hemoglobin. And so the remaining color is just that nutrient auger kind of golden color. We call that beta hemolytic. Another option is alpha hemolytic, which is a partial hemolysis. And these tend to be a little darker, almost a greenish halo. Uh, where the, the uh, cells are partially lysed uh, and yet the hemoglobin is not being degraded and it gives it this oddball color. Both of these alpha uh, cytotoxins or hemotoxins, hemolytic toxins, and beta hemolytic toxins are important toxins that bacteria can secrete because not only can they destroy these red blood cells, they can destroy other cells in us. So getting back to the, the question on the previous slide, why do bacteria secrete toxins? Well, yeah, they might be just trying to weaken you in general, make you a better petri dish, <clears throat> but if they can bust open cells, there's a whole lot more nutrients inside the cells than outside the cells. Think of the cell as like an egg. Imagine somebody gives you an egg and says, here's your breakfast, but all you can do is lick it. You're not going to get a whole lot out of it, but if you can break that open, you can get to all the nutrients on the inside. So hemolytic toxins allow the bacteria to break open these cells like eggs and get to all the rich nutrients on the outside. And of course, that does a lot of damage to you as the host. There are two main ways that we see these cytotoxins functioning. Um, some will form a pore called a membrane attack complex, where one version or one copy of the protein polymerizes with another, 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 and they form a tube or a channel, a barrel that sits in the membrane. And they make the membrane leaky and nutrients are rushing out, but water is also rushing in because of uh, uh, the, the gradient of solutes. And so ultimately the cell is going to burst open and everything's going to come out. So there's the possibility of making these channels or pores called membrane attack complexes to make the cell leaky. And others are specifically phospholipase enzymes that degrade phospholipids until eventually the cell can't uh, repair itself and the integrity of the membrane is compromised enough that the cell busts open as well. But in either case, you end up with, with cellular contents being released for the bacteria to feed on and damage to the patient. So those are the cytotoxins. But remember, all four of those terms are referring to the same thing. Cytotoxin, uh, cytolytic toxin, hemolysin, hemolytic toxin, all talking about the same kind of toxins. All right, second category are neurotoxins 
and as the name implies, they simply interfere with proper neurological function. Two classic examples, both come from Clostridium species, Clostridium botulinum and Clostridium tetani. These are spore-forming, gram-positive rods, uh, and they're anaerobes. So these need to grow in anaerobic conditions, which uh, if we had time to talk about it, you could see really does explain the um, mode of transmission for both botulism and tetanus. In both cases, they have a toxin, the tetanus toxin and the botulinum toxin. Um, both of these toxins actually were acquired by transduction. So a phage actually appears to have brought those toxins in and the cell incorporated into its own chromosome. And now we have essentially a new species from what was once probably a harmless soil organism. But in both cases, we end up with paralysis. So they both interfere with neurological signaling associated with muscle contraction. In the case of botulinum toxin, it impedes muscle contraction. And so the muscle can't contract, everything goes limp, and you end up with a limp paralysis. Tetanus toxin does the opposite, where it causes the muscles all to contract and lock up, and you end up with a contractile paralysis. So you have a flaccid or limp paralysis with botulinum toxin, or Botox, by the way, or you have a, uh, a contractile rigid paralysis, as in the case with tetanus toxin. In both cases, the host usually dies by suffocation because the diaphragm can't alternately relax and contract, relax and contract, because one or the other toxins is impeding that. So neurotoxins are a second category. And the third common category of exotoxins are the enterotoxins. Now don't confuse that with endotoxin that we talked about earlier. Endo just means inside of. Endotoxin is almost always referring to lipid A on gram negatives. Entero is a prefix that we typically use to talk about the intestines. So enterotoxins attack the lining of the GI tract and cause uh, vomiting, diarrhea, nausea, etc. They're pretty common toxins, in fact. <clears throat> For example, they often cause food poisoning. So there are staphylococcal enterotoxins that Staph aureus can produce. Uh, e. coli produces several different enterotoxins, including one called ST, that is heat stable, which means that if a food product was mishandled prior to cooking, cooking will only kill the E. coli, but it won't destroy the toxin. So the food will still be toxic. The, the person will acquire what's called a uh, toxicity or intoxication food poisoning as opposed to a foodborne infection. Perfringens enterotoxin, which is yet another Clostridium species, Clostridium perfringens, that's commonly involved in various forms of food poisoning. Cholera is not a food poisoning, but uh, Vibrio cholerae uh, causes the disease cholera, a waterborne disease that causes profuse dehydrating diarrhea um, to the point of where I've read reports of people dying within 24 hours because they've lost so much water. Imagine the human body like a big sponge. Cholera enterotoxin just squeezes that sponge dry in a really short order and leaves the, the cells and the tissues unable to function because they're, uh, they're completely dehydrated and the brain as well. Okay, a uh, quick lesson summary. Let's review what we just talked about. Endotoxin refers to lipid A of LPS, which means that all gram-negative bacteria have endotoxin. Something important to keep in mind when we think about uh, the virulence of gram-negative bacteria. Exotoxins, on the other hand, are secreted proteins, and there are three main types of exotoxins, or three common types of endo exotoxins. The cytotoxins, which have multiple names, keep that in mind, like hemolytic toxins. Neurotoxins that go after the nerve cells, and enterotoxins that go after the lining of the intestinal tract. So that is part three. We have one more part to go. Be sure to join me.